Good evening. Uh, I'd like to call our meeting to order. Turn to board member Betty Jenkins to open the meeting. Good evening. If you please stand for the pledge at the board, um, if you may stand in for a moment of silence. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like to call on board member Kim Irby um, to begin with our recognitions this evening. Okay, thank you. I don't know what I do with my cup. Thank you. We will now begin our recognitions, and tonight we start by honoring the life of someone very special to Guilford County Schools. Former Guilford County Schools Chief of Staff Nora Carr passed away on June 30th, 2022. Nora was a fierce advocate for public education and a national expert in the field of public relations and communication. She inspired those around her to push harder, to do the impossible, and to raise their voices for what is right. She brought out the best in people, not only in their professional lives, but in their personal ones too. Those who had the privilege to know her were forever changed by her honesty, her persistence, and her passion. I will now call on board member Kim Irby to read aloud the resolution honoring Nora's life and work. Thank you, Chairman honoring the life and legacy of Dr. Nora Carr. Whereas Dr. Nora Carr, APR fellow, PRSA, a beloved Guilford County Schools leader, North Carolina School Public Relations Association, and National School Public Relations Association professional, passed away on Thursday, June 30th, 2022. And whereas Dr. Carr retired in 2021 after a stellar 13 year career with GCS, and whereas having served as chief of staff for GCS for 13 years, Dr. Carr served as a champion for equity and made an immeasurable impact on public education. And at GCS, Dr. Carr oversaw government relations, internal and external communications, special events, media relations, parent and community relations grant development. And whereas she was posthumously awarded the governor of North Carolina's most prestigious award, the Order of the Longleaf Pine, for her exemplary service to the state of North Carolina and community that is above and beyond the call of duty and which has made a significant impact and strengthened North Carolina. And whereas as Dr. Carr served as the president of the NSPRA, she made an indelible impact on school public relations, receiving the president's award, NSPRS, NSPRA's highest honor for outstanding professionalism and integrity throughout her career. And whereas in 2017, NCSPRA named Dr. Carr the Barry Gaskin Service Award recipient. And whereas those who knew her best say that Dr. Carr's superpower was her unwavering passion and commitment to equity and justice for all. And whereas Dr. Carr always spoke of the importance of every child having at least one loving adult to care for them. And whereas Dr. Carr was a national leader in crisis response and was on site during the aftermath at the Columbine High School. And whereas Dr. Carr was called upon to help school districts across the nation handle crisis response. And whereas as a leader, Dr. Carr officially and unofficially mentored countless school public relations professionals, school and district administrators, teachers, educators, students, and families. And whereas despite her many accomplishments, Dr. Carr was one who was always willing to help by selflessly giving all of her gifts and talents to support public education 
and student achievement. And whereas Dr. Carr loved Guilford County Schools and Guilford County Schools loved her back, even after her retirement and subsequent role as the Assistant Director of the Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation in Winston-Salem. And whereas Dr. Carr was a stickler for professionalism and excellence, thereby making each of us better in our work, a legacy that continues today. And whereas thanks to her visionary, compassionate and groundbreaking leadership in the field of school public relations and public education, her efforts will continue to transform both students' learning and life outcomes for decades to come. And whereas the Guilford County Schools and the Guilford County Board of Education thank her family and her beloved husband, Kevin, for sharing Dr. Carr with us for 13 years. And therefore, be it resolved, we, the Guilford County Board of Education, extend our heartfelt condolences to all who knew and loved Dr. Carr. Please know that our more than 9,000 employees, 68,000 families, and Guilford County community grieve with you and that our deepest hope is that all will take comfort in knowing that Dr. Nora Carr's legacy of love and leadership will, will remain cherished and impactful locally, regionally, statewide, and nationally for generations to come. It's signed by Dina Hayes, chairperson, and Whitney Oakley, our acting superintendent. Thank you. We have members of Nora's family here tonight, as well as her former boss and our former superintendent, Mo Green. Family and friends, will you please come forward so we can offer our condolences. Thank you. We will continue tonight's meeting by remembering three students who passed away <clears throat> last school year. Although we celebrate their lives and the positive impact they made on the Guilford County Schools family, our hearts are extended in grief to their loved ones. On behalf of the Board of Education, we'd like to extend our deepest condolences to the families, friends, and teachers of Angel Walker, Peyton Fly, and Colby Bean. Angel Walker was the most exemplary student one could imagine. Angel frequently referenced her mother, Maria, and her sister, Jamara, Jamare. She spoke about her favorite outings with them and going out to eat seemed to take the cake. Whenever her teacher spoke about her throughout the year, there was always the same feeling. Angel truly lived up to her name and she was a and it was in heaven was heaven sent. The staff and students at Eastern Middle would describe Angel as the most genuine soul with a name that fits her perfectly. We are also thankful to have known her, known this messenger of strength, love, positivity, courage, and hope. 
Hayden Fly brought a love for life to her time at the Guilford eLearning Virtual Academy, and her peers found it contagious. She quickly became a good friend to so many in her class. Her favorite part of each day was selecting the daily interactive online game that the class played. As they ended the year, Peyton got weaker and attended class whenever she could. The students knew she was sick and wanted only the best for their sweet friend. They made a pact with Peyton. Anytime she could join class, they would stop and play a game of her choice. Peyton loved this time each day with her peers and they, they in turn learned to embrace life. Peyton carried a sparkle in her eyes that could not be dimmed. She carried pure joy in her heart, which she brought as a gift to each person who met her. Peyton will forever be a phoenix, and the students and staff miss her greatly. <clears throat> Colby Bean has had a profound impact on every student, staff member, and individual who had the privilege to know him during his time at Brooks Global and Kaiser Middle. Beneath his easygoing disposition and laid back personality was one of the most courageous, determined, and dedicated students his teachers have ever taught. Despite having to spend most of the year learning from home during his ongoing treatment, Colby's sweet presence was always felt by those who knew him. He never let his prognosis become an excuse for not giving his best effort with his schoolwork, and he loved to please his teachers and parents. <clears throat> the short time that he felt strong enough to attend school in person was the brightest part of the school year for those at Kaiser Middle. He was so happy to be able to spend that time at Kaiser and to be back with the teachers and students who had grown to love him over the year. Colby's gentleness, compassion, inquisitiveness, and curiosity made Kaiser a better place, and he will forever be remembered by his friends, family, and staff who knew him. Although we were only privileged to know these students for a brief amount of time, in their own ways, they helped to create heartwarming memories that will be cherished forever. To honor these students, please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. At this time, we'd like to invite any family members or school representatives in attendance to come forward to receive condolences from the board. Thank you. 
<clears throat> and finally tonight, <clears throat> we will recognize our August Employee of the Month, Sandy Enfinger. Will you please come to the podium? Payroll is a department that everybody needs, but most people don't think about unless or until there's a problem. Sandy Enfinger makes sure the nearly 10,000 employees in Guilford County Schools don't have to think about payroll very often. As a program administrator in the payroll department, she assists with setting up new employee accounts, processes paychecks for staff on a wide variety of schedules, and addresses issues should they arise. Her helpful nature earned her a nomination and the title of August Guilford County Schools Employee of the Month. Sandy is amazing, wrote Jackson Middle multi-classroom leader Deanna Johnson. She is always kind and gracious with any email or phone call received about payroll. She is always friendly and efficient, and if I ever need to call her for anything, she will promptly respond and make sure that I am a priority. Every wants their paychecks to be correct, and we all know that systems have glitches and even human error occurs. I have never called or needed Sandy I have never called or needed Sandy, and she didn't come through for me and countless others. She is truly a jewel. Sandy received a $50 gift card courtesy of the Greensboro JCs, and during the month of August, your photo will be displayed at the district's central offices and the payroll department and the Greensboro JC office. At this time, I'd like to ask board member Anita Sharp to read aloud the certificate honoring Sandy. Sandy, on behalf of the Guilford County Board of Education, I present to you this Certificate of Recognition, recognition as Employee of the Month for August of 2022, signed by Acting Superintendent Dr. Whitney Oakley and Board Chair Dina Hayes. And on a personal note, let me say, I've prepared payroll for a long, long time. <laughs> I appreciate you. Yours Thank is you. very complicated, and, and to get this kind of praise from those you serve is just amazing. And if you'd like to say a few words, okay. please do. Thank you very much. I am very humbled and very appreciative. Um, payroll doesn't often get recognized unless we do something wrong. <laughs> Um, we try very hard, but we do have problems and we do have glitches. Um, I, we all, my whole payroll team, my, my director, Angie, Tara, they all stand behind us and support us. And it takes all of us to make it right. Thank you. Thank you. And we'd like for you and your team and Angie to come up so the board can shake your hand. Okay. Any family members, if anybody's here with you. All right, we are now at public comments. We have four people signed up. First uh, is Michael Logan, uh, and on deck is Nelson Stover. So, Mr. Logan, as you're approaching the podium, I know you know all of this, but you have three minutes to make your comments. When the amber light comes on, you have 15 seconds left. If you'll start by giving your name and address, I'd appreciate that. Welcome. 
Thank you for allowing me to speak here. My name is Michael Logan. I live at 5202 Brambling Road, and I am a Guilford County taxpayer and also an employee of Guilford County Schools. Um, I'm here to, actually, before we get into anything, let's give a shout out to the GAP program. This month, we will have 28 graduates of the GAP, and we'll have 56 students going in. Almost every year of the GAP program, I have had a student within that program. It's a good program. Now, with that, I'm here to talk about North End Communications. Um, that is a service that we're looking at doing a contract with. I'd like to point out some things on North End Communications. And this is some information I found off the internet. Of they took a chance on a North Omaha community struggling with widespread violence, poverty, unemployment, launched an outsourced multi-channel contract call center. Today, thanks to a loan from NMTC financing, the organization is pursuing its mission in full force, bringing jobs to a community with extreme levels of unemployment and poverty. As an educational system, our two main priorities are educating and education for jobs. And I would also like to see us support our community. What we're looking at here, last year we gave $852,000 from money that we had saved in the transportation budget. We're looking at spending $1,375,840 next year with the option of doing a four, three years on a contract. With that being said, when we're all done, that will be a six million three hundred fifty five thousand three hundred and sixty dollar investment over five years 1.4 million is what it took to get that company off the ground and running we're going to invest six over six million dollars in five years why are we not investing that money in our community in guilford county that's taxpayer money why is it going to Nebraska? Now, with that being said, going back to the GAP program, those could be jobs that GAP students could do. Those are jobs that we can incorporate within our school system, I would believe. I don't see why not. That could be training we could incorporate within our school system. Let's keep our money in Guilford County. We just got $1.7 billion. Let's keep that money in Guilford County. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Logan, and thank you for what you do for our students in the district. Uh, Nelson Stover, followed by Sherry Pikett. Welcome, Mr. Stover. Thank you, you have three minutes to speak. If you'll begin by saying your name and address. When an amber light comes on, you have 15 seconds left. Good. Thank you. Uh, first of all, good evening, members of the Guilford County School Board. Uh, thank you for letting me speak. My name is Frederick Nelson Stover. I live at 5911 Western Trail. Uh, that's in uh, Voting Precinct FR4 out near the airport. I'm speaking to you tonight on behalf of uh, Solar Power Now. That's a uh, coalition of care-filled organizations here in Guilford County that are committed to seeing that the institutions in our county successfully make the transition to 100% clean renewable energy before the middle of this century. Very practically, we're asking the school board to formally adopt a resolution making a commitment to 100% renewable energy by 2050. We believe that making such a commitment is within the purview and the power of the board. We strongly encourage you to make that bold commitment. I'm a firm believer in the proposition that when leaders take a clear and compelling vision, the institutional structures find the creativity to bring that future into fruition. Lacking a grand vision, institutions flounder toward mundane boredom and social neglect. 
I could spend a lot of time trying to address the importance of global warming, but I trust you understand that. I could go into great detail about the practical options now becoming available, but I trust you're aware that electric buses and solar panels are now easily available. Our Solar Power Now Coalition last year worked with the city of Greensboro uh, and the city council adopted a resolution to move toward 100% clean energy by 2040. Once the city council approved that vision, they hired a sustainability officer. The Susta sustainability council wrote an energy plan and they're moving in that direction. Now, Guilford County school system is a major presence in this county. Students and parents alike are influenced by the design and functioning of schools in every part of the county. The school board has a unique opportunity to take a positive leadership position to educate both in the classroom and through the classroom. I look forward to working with the school board and its policy commission toward the approval of a definitive statement that the county school board is working toward achieving 100% sustainability by 2050. Thank you, look forward to working with you. Thank you, Mr. Stover. Sherry Pikett, followed by our final speaker, Nolan Jones. All right, Nolan Jones. Well, Mr. Jones, as you're approaching the podium, um, you, uh, we'd like for you to begin by saying your name and address. You have three minutes to speak. When the amber light comes on, you have 15 seconds left. Welcome. Okay. I'm Nolan Jones, resident of Greensboro. I guess you guys can hear me now? Yes. I'd like to open up with, uh, I'm glad to see all of you back for a new school season. And, uh, it was kind of shocking for me to walk up here and I didn't have armed guards and, you know, people standing outside. So we're definitely under a different climate now in terms of my people are going to get engaged with you. But I'm back here and I'm pretty sure Miss Oakley may remember me from uh, our Zoom conference back during the pandemic. And I was trying to show her my application and she was struggling to see it, which I could understand. And after, you know, a year plus now has gone by. I've redesigned my application to where that not only can a two-year-old use it, but someone over 40 can see it and understand what it is. And what I'd like to propose to you guys is that I'd like to you know, come back to you and show it to you. But this time, please bring in one of your pre-K students, one of your first grade students, one of your second and third grade students, so that you can actually see how the application is going to be such a game changer if you only give it a chance. Because these children, they recognize through their intuition that this is something that's good for them. And so I'm glad to see all of you back and please get in contact with me. And congratulations for your new position, Ms. Oakley. Thank you, Mr. Right, Jones. Thank you. And that concludes our um, public comments. We are now at the agenda. Is there a motion? Move the agenda. Second. second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, um, we are at um, the consent agenda, and um, I don't believe, I know that Linda had some questions, but they were resolved. Okay, and Kim had some questions, they were resolved. Yes. Okay, so everybody's fine. All right, so um, let's see. Anita? Madam Chair, no, yes. we need a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'm sorry, and I didn't give Dr. Oakley a chance to yes. say anything. Yes. <laughs> Good evening. I'm just moving fast. No problem. This evening's consent agenda includes the approval of the July meeting minutes, the personnel report, the 22-23 state applications for federal ESSER funds, state application for federal funds, titles 1, 2, 3, and 4, the Every Student Succeeds Act alternative accountability model, the 22-23 contractual agreement with North End Teleservices, for the district-wide transportation call center and lastly the technology and data institute tdi service agreement for internet access to gcs families that concludes this evening's consent agenda for your consideration second thank you 
Uh, no questions. All right, Anita, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, on all but F. Okay. Deborah? Yes to all. Betty? Yes to all. Yes Kim? to all. Linda? Uh, I'm going to say yes to all, but I also do want to reiterate what Mr. Uh, Logan said that we need to try to keep as much money in Gufford County as we can. Thank you. Pat? Uh, yes to all. Uh, no on item F. Okay, so um, A, B, C, D, E, I'm sorry, Diane, I'm sorry, I didn't even vote either. Yes to all. Thank you, and Dina, yes to all. Okay, so that is uh, unanimous items A through uh, E and item G and six to two on item F. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. All right, and um, Winston McGregor um, had a late dentist appointment and will not be with us this evening. Um, so thank you. We are now at comments from the chair, and I have a few things. Good evening and welcome. Students who will be in pre-K, kindergarten, seventh grade, or twelfth grade next year are required by law to receive certain vaccinations, along with any student who will be enrolled in a North Carolina public school for the first time. The county, uh, Guilford County Department of Public Health will host a series of immunization clinics specifically for these students. The clinics will be held from 4.30 to 6.30 in High Point on August 11th and 16th and in Greensboro on August 18th. Both clinics will be open from 4.30 to 6.30 p.m. Monday through Friday from August 22nd to September the 1st. Visit our health services and nursing page for more information. Congratulations to Anna Quarles, district-wide teacher, leader in the Exceptional Children Professional Learning Department as the 2022 Dyslexia Aware Teacher of the Year. The award honors the efforts of teachers who embody the science of reading. Educators who are nominated for the award demonstrate the most effective and inclusive instruction for their students. Quarles works both with individual students and as a trainer to support Guilford County Schools teachers in understanding and addressing dyslexia. The district's back to school website is live. Visit www.gcsnc.com um, slash back to school 22 for answers to your questions about bell schedules, bus times, open house dates, supply list, and more. You will also find detailed information about how to volunteer, how to receive important updates from the district, how to view your child's academic progress and other important information through the PowerSchool parent portal. Lastly, members of the Joint Capital and Facilities Committee met today to discuss the progress of the district's bond-funded facilities improvements. Guilford County School staff and industry experts briefed the committee on the current school designs for the 2020 voter-approved $300 million school bond program, which prioritizes enhancing learning, improving safety and security, supporting workforce development, and strengthening the community. Site work on six of the projects is set to begin later this month. Guilford County School staff and industry experts also addressed the various factors impacting school construction, including inflation, supply chain issues, and labor shortages. Additionally, county staff presented an initial financial plan for debt service on both the 2020 school bond and the 2022 voter-approved $1.7 billion school facilities bond program. And finally, I would like to read a letter we received from the Greensboro Aquatic Center, our partner in the Learn to Swim program. It reads, Dear members of the Guilford County Board of Education, on behalf of the Greensboro Aquatic Center, we would like to thank the Guilford County Board of Education for its unanimous approval of a new policy to provide second grade students in the district with access to water safety instruction. When the <coughs> Greensboro Aquatic Center opened in the fall of 2011, one of its priority missions was to implement a learn to swim program to teach water safety skills to young people in our community, particularly for those with little to no access to receive this type of instruction. Our partnership with Guilford County Schools that began in 2012 with four pilot elementary schools and 257 second graders receiving lessons at the um, Greensboro Aquatic Center has now grown to over 1,900 students from 35 schools receiving instruction at eight different locations in 2021-2022. To date, 10,260 second graders have received the benefits of this healthy lifestyle program, all at no cost to the student. 
This tremendous growth would not have been possible without the support of the Board of Education that has made the Learn to S Lean to Swim program a priority to benefit the health and well-being of its students and help address the racial disparities in drowning deaths in our nation. The Greensboro Aquatic Center would also like to take the opportunity to thank Board of Education member T. Diane Bellamy Small for her remarkable dedication to the Learn to Swim program, beginning with her support of the Greensboro Aquatic Center as a city council member to her advocating for additional funding to expand the program to the countless hours she has spent in the pool as a volunteer instructor. We are deeply grateful for all of her efforts. I have seen firsthand the huge smiles and sense of accomplishment the students after completing the Learn to Swim program. With the support of the Board of Education, we will continue to strive toward our goal of providing all Guilford County Schools second grade students with swimming and water safety lessons on an annual basis. We thank all of you for your commitment to not only helping to save lives, but also to change and enrich the lives of children in our community. Sincerely, Susan Brayman, Executive Director, Greensboro Aquatic Center, Learn to Swim program with Guilford County Schools. And thank you again, um, Ms. Bellamy Smalls, and this concludes my remarks. Um, we will now turn to um, Acting Superintendent, Dr. Whitney Oakley, for your report. Thank you and good evening. I'm happy to share that last week marked the first day of school for our early and middle colleges and academies and today was the first day of school for our extended year schools. It's an exciting time for parents and staff as we reconnect with familiar faces and welcome new ones for the first time. On August 15th, schools on the restart calendar will return. And finally, we will welcome all students on August 29th, just a few short weeks away. Our team has been hard at work all summer, preparing to kickstart a great school year. We look forward to welcoming our more than 68,000 students and families back to schools and classrooms. I do wanna thank our principals, our school staff and district staff for diligence in getting buildings and classrooms prepared for the start of school. And we look forward to continuing to build positive and nurturing relationships with all students and families. It is important to note that the federal waivers that allowed districts to serve free breakfast and lunch to all students have ended. All parents, regardless of income, are encouraged to fill out the meal benefits application because this information is used for other purposes, including EBT benefits and Title I designations. To fill out the application, go to www.lunchapplication.com. If you participate in an assistance program, you will need to know your case number, not your card or account number when filling out the form. If not, you will need to know your adjusted gross income and any social security or retirement benefits you receive. I wanna thank our team, including our district leaders, Dr. K, Dr. Lewis, Ms. Edwards, and Ms. Hayes, for leading various efforts to collect meal applications from families. They and their teams have been hard at work, knocking on doors, calling parents, posting on social media, and other outreach efforts to ensure we reach all families. On Thursday, August 4th, I had the pleasure to participate in un the unveiling of the new A&T Four Middle College at North Carolina A&T State University. The legacy of the A&T Four lives on through the young men who walk the North Carolina A&T campus as middle college students and learn to take on the world. In late July, we held the annual Summer Leadership Institute, a week-long professional development event with our principals, assistant principals, and district leaders. It was an inspiring and informative event, and I always enjoy the collaboration and team building that results from our bringing talented educators together. We also held our Management Institute for our leaders who are responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the school district. I could not be more grateful for the leadership we have in GCS and for all of our employees. They are hardworking people who give their absolute best so all of our students can achieve their full potential. There is no question that these last few years have truly been some of the most challenging years in public education. Whenever and wherever our staff were needed most in these last few years, they kept showing up and their dedication has not gone unnoticed. And here we are again, ready for another school year because of their hard work and commitment to our families. Thank you. 
Finally, I would like to say congratulations to this year's retirees who will be celebrated at a retirement reception tomorrow. The 271 retirees have more than 5,700 combined years of service. We applaud their commitment to our students. This concludes my remarks. And before Mr. Ritchie um, shares a brief safety update, I just wanna give the board a few reminders. You'll remember um, that our last meeting, we talked a little bit about student mental health and the intersection that it has with school safety, um, deeply connected between mental health and school safety. Um, and we know that it remains a top priority for our board. Um, and our district leadership as we embark on a new school year. A reminder to the public and to the board that some specific school safety questions may not be able to be answered in open session just due to the nature um, of, of the question, um, but we will certainly answer the questions that we are able to following Mr. Ritchie's presentation, which will be an update on school safety. Welcome. See if we can get the lighting right, I guess. We'll start, start with that. So um, thank you, Dr. Oakley. Many of the slides you're going to see over the next few minutes, um, y'all have seen before, and we've discussed a lot of this material. But Dr. Oakley and the leadership team felt it was very important to bring this to the forefront for our parents and our community as kids go back to school because it is on everyone's mind, and so now is the right time to talk about it. And so I'm going to go over some of these slides again that y'all have seen, but to do it as a context for those others that are watching tonight that may not have seen them. We're going to frame this in the way of a national, our national context around school safety and violence. We're going to put this around factors leading to school violence, district safety and security strategy, our project updates, and then our summer training partnerships today. The national context, um, I don't know that there's a whole lot I need to say about that, quite frankly. I think we're all up to date on where we are. Uvalde has, the, the tragedy at Uvalde has renewed the community in parental concern for our children's safety and has brought it to the forefront. Um, I'd like to think that it had never left this room's forefront, quite frankly, when I look around the room. This has stayed in our, our pace, and we've talked about it. We've had presentations and had work being done since the first day here, including June 26th when we updated uh, you last, and then last uh, month when we discussed child mental health and the need around that. A couple of things around this. Um, my daughter's a student in the school system as well. And I'm a past law enforcement officer, 30 years, and retired from Greensboro PD, as you all know. And so one of the things that I want to discuss is that initial response. And I've had long discussions with Guilford County Sheriff's Department, Greensboro Police Department, High Point Police Department, and I've attended some of their training. And, of course, just last year I was attending the training. Um, in North Carolina... Our officers are taught that they will go in no matter what. They'll go in alone. They'll go in with two. They'll go in with three. Whatever is there when they first get there, they'll go in. But bottom line is, if there is a school shooting, they are trained to go in and to act. The first person on scene is in command, period. When the next person gets in that outranks them, they'll take command. But you are taught and trained that you will make a decision and you will go in. And that is what these three agencies have taught. We'll talk a little bit about our partnerships with this, this summer to give them the sp some space to train in and some training that they have uh, done this summer and a little bit that is still left before school starts. But I wanted to reassure that and let that know that in North Carolina, every individual is trained. You go in immediately. You don't wait. And it is stressed, re-stressed, and put in any way, shape, and form. Let's continue to talk about the national stage around violence. This article here, I know many of you have seen that. For decades, auto accidents have been the number one cause of death among children. But in 2020, guns passed, surpassed 
auto accidents. In 2021, almost 20 million guns were purchased in the United States. Again, I'm not passing judgment on this. We're putting out the fact that there are a lot of guns out on the street today. So this is one of the reasons why we need to take action to look at that. Continuing these statistics, 2021 saw the greatest number of active shooters in schools and non-active shooters, but school shooting incidents in the history of the U.S. And in 2022, if you look at that number, it actually would be the record, even though we're only a little more than halfway across, if 2021 did not happen. Let's review the factors leading to school violence. I'm going to go through this slide fairly quickly because, again, it's something that, that most people have seen here. But I think it's very important to know, and this goes back to why we set the stage last week, uh, last month, with Mr. Robinson's presentation around school mental health and behavioral threat assessments. And that is that 91% of school attackers had observable psychological, behavioral, or neurological symptoms prior to they're acting out. 80% had been bullied at one point or another, and 63% showed severe signs of depression, sadness, and isolation. So I realize that I'm talking around a, an emotional subject in very objective terms, and so please bear with me and recognize that, that I do recognize the emotions behind this and the fact that attacking an emotional problem with logic and with, with numbers is really hard to get that across, but it's just an important part. to We have to break this down and have to look at this in a very, I guess, logical and detached way at times, but that doesn't take the emotions out of this event and out of these events. It's important to point out that school violence 84% of school violence happens in high schools. About 15% happens in middle schools, and 1% happens in elementary schools. That doesn't make it any less tragic or make us any less concerned for the elementary schools. My very first presentation to you all, I, I explained that I was going to show you this slide every opportunity I had. Um, it's it can be kind of a boring slide, but it does talk a little bit about what it is we do and how we look at things, and that the fact that we use multiple layers to prevent violence in our school. It's very important to understand that all of our approaches are very much, think of them as a net where you have cross hatching, and it continues to cross as you add layers, which makes a little bit more of every sediment caught. So I really hope that the only two slides the, the only two parts of this that I ever have to deal with are mitigation and prevention and preparedness. That's what we spend most of our time on, and that's what we're here to try to do, mitigate any problems and prevent any. But we have to know and we have to be ready for and for response and recovery. All four of those pieces are what make our emergency preparedness proper and help us work with the agencies we work with to make sure that any emergency will be covered. And this is in the context of school safety around violence at this point, but this also goes to fruition whether it is school violence or whether it is a natural disaster, a fire, tornado, severe storm, anything along those lines. Set so our first steps, our emergency district emergency operations plan. We have that plan. We have that plan is shared with our principals. It is shared with our schools. And we have threat assessments. We talked about that last month. We'll continue to talk about that. And then we have incident-specific response procedures in this plan for, for about any major incident that you can, can imagine. Our individual school safety plans, they are accurate and up-to-date. We're getting the new ones in for this year now. The principals are reviewing them and going over them with their staffs when their staff gets in. Again, this is very much at the forefront of their concern. The creation of school safety teams always means the right people in the right roles. And then we practice it. 
and that is the part that, that I just can't say enough, is that it's very important that as a staff, before the students ever get here, that our principals walk through and rehearse this plan. And it's as simple as taking your safety teams and walking through the school and walking to your evacuation locations, walking to your evacuation plans, discussing, throwing it out there. What will we do if this happens? What will we do if that happens? And our principals are doing that. The keys in here are everyone has a role and that we must review and discuss that role. The other piece that we've asked is that they include a piece of safety in every monthly staff meeting in their schools. Now jump into the project updates. Uh, in June, we briefed you on the touchless security screeners. The pilot program has been completed. We felt that it was quite successful. Um, we had at our two, I remember seeing many of y'all at our two community events, and it was nice of you to come by and visit and take a look at these and really see what they can do. Um, our first two, Kearns Academy and Academy at Smith, started their school year on August 4th, last Thursday, with the first two Evolve Express security scanners in their schools. Our next steps are the rest of those screeners are actually in our warehouses here in Guilford County today. They've been here for a, about a week or so. And we are uh, installing them next week August 15th through the 18th at each of the remaining um, high schools. During that time, we will also conduct training as they go in, and then we will conduct additional training the week of the 23rd and 24th with each set of teams from the high schools. And one of the things that excited about is the fact that they will be in place on open house night. So like many of y'all who attended the open house, we can do that same effect, have that same effect at the schools where the kids can walk through and see it before they see it the first day of school if they have a desire to do so. Again, it's really about making them feel comfortable with them and recognizing what that those Evolve scanners can make their life safe, but they are not intimidating and they will not um, create some of the issues that we've been worried about in the past. We have completed a competitive process for the RFP for the radio frequency update. For many of y'all, I want to remind you that that is the part where that is the radio uh, control piece for our emergency responders that enhances their radio coverage inside of our schools. Most of you know our schools are, most of them are old, have thick walls and lots of brick, concrete, and metal, and it's hard for radio signals to get out. This will enhance that in um, our most critical needs schools. We have a, um, identified a number of schools where the radio communication could be better. And those are the schools that we'll, we'll work through this project with. Work will begin on August 22nd and it will last in approximately 30 to 40 weeks, depending on how the progress goes within each school. Security cameras. Uh, we have uh, finalized our vendor, vendor interviews for the video management system. We will be selecting a vendor, uh, hopefully within this next week or so and the current cameras will be updated with the video management system. Whichever system we choose out of the vendors that have presented allows our systems to be, the systems that are currently, and not getting into too many details, that a number of our systems will immediately be able to be upgraded and ready to go. And those that aren't, we will immediately begin doing additional work and installations of cameras across the district where they're needed. Last year, we introduced through a grant the Crisis Go application. It's a communications application that's meant to be at the site campus level, so at different school campuses. And it's designed to give the administrative staff the ability to, uh, to real-time talk to teachers as needed through a, basically it's a texting application that allows them to go back and forth and explain if there's an emergency or something they need, something they need to check out. The other piece to this is it's also our safety drill management tool. So last March, we began using it for all safety drills. So that's tornado drills, fire drills, lockdown drills. And um, it allows, again, for that to happen, to go to the teacher's phone or to their laptop to be seen fairly immediately, depending on where the teacher keeps that laptop or phone, right? 
we're, we're really stressing. We hope they'll keep the phone on them from this point forward. But of course, most of them are trying to set a good example and not appear as they're texting the same as, as we're asking the students not to. So it's that fine ba balance, right? But this gives the ability to do that. The, the next step in this app is that there's an upgrade coming in the next, we've been promised it in the next month, that's outside of our control, but we do know that it'll happen this fall, that will allow students to use this as an anonymous report line, anonymous tip report line. And the advantage of this over some of the other anonymous uh, tip lines that we've looked at is that this will be reported directly to the admin staff in that school. So if there is an issue, I think I heard somebody in the locker room say A, B, or C, they can text that, the anonymity of this to the school leadership, it does have, it's basically an, an anonymizer inside the application that will allow the principal to go back and ask questions of the person who made that tip so that you can continue the conversation one-on-one. -on -one. For many of y'all who have uh, teenage children and, and all you understand that Sometimes you have to drag the information out because they're not sure what is important. And this gives us that ability to do that. And it gives us the ability to do it at the school leadership level so that it can be taken care of immediately, right there in the heart of where things might be happening. So a number of these upgrades are the upgrades that we have discussed and we were hoping to, to push through. Some of this will come with the 2022 bond monies. Some of this we've already started because we didn't feel it could wait for the 2022 bond monies to, to be approved. Um, and we've seen these before. I wanna hit on a few of the important ones and that's gonna be the upkeep of cameras. So once we get the cameras and get them where they need to be, we're going to have to find that funding to, to push forward and maintain them or else we're, we'll be in a position where we need to do this all over again. And the, the goal is to keep this moving, right? Um, locks in classrooms and exterior door locks are also a focus over this next coming period. The exterior door locks have been replaced in most, most schools with the RFID card that many of you have seen. The interior is, our, is gonna be our next focus along with maintenance. Um, we'll be working on that very very closely here in the next piece. We talked about elementary schools. And so the one thing that I've asked, been asked a number of times is how do we make our elementary schools safer? And we talk about whether the screeners that we're using would work in elementary schools. And the reality is, as we discussed in um, June, the screeners are designed to keep problems from stepping into because the threat in high school and middle school is typically from within and the students from within. In elementary school, it's not, it's from people from without. So the most important part of elementary school safety is the hardening. It's like anything else we talked about the balance before. I'm not gonna get too much into the balance today, but I'm gonna talk about the hardening part of the elementary schools, which is following our procedures and keeping those doors locked at all times, keeping the building itself secure. A vestibule, if you remember, that was planned as part of the $353 million, as part $353 million of that bond go towards safety and security upgrades. And vestibules for elementary schools that do not have them have been planned. And so that is gonna be one of our goals is to get that project started as quick as we can because the vestibules are the safest way. It creates a safe barrier between the staff and school and getting into the school. So what a vestibule will do is in order to be let in, they'll have to go to the intercom system as they do now. And many of y'all have been in the schools and realize this. Once they walk into the vestibule, that is a place that will be such that the staff can see the full person. With the intercoms, you see a fisheye view, much like a doorbell camera, right? Many of you have seen the ring cameras. It's, it's not unlike that. So what a vestibule do, does is it brings that person into an area that is safe and secure because the glass between them and the school is hardened. And in best practices would be bullet resistant. Nothing is bulletproof, but bullet resistant. So it gives a safe place and a location for the staff to look at the person, to make sure there's no weapons visible and to make sure if they're in an agitated state, maybe that's not the time to let them in. Maybe it's time to call 911 and, and get police to respond, right? It gives them that added layer and defense. So that's what we're working on 
for the elementary schools. I'd like to talk a little bit about our summer training partnerships. And, and I mentioned it earlier because I felt it was very important in the Uvalde slide to discuss the training. Each of the three um, departments have or are either in the middle of various types of active shooter training. And we're allowing them to utilize the current Faust and Claxton Elementary School buildings prior to the demolition. This gives them buildings with classrooms and all of the nooks and crannies that come with schools, whether they're 50 years old or brand new in design. Um, to, to, to go in and to practice and to see what this looks like. In addition, the High Point Police Department has scheduled three community sessions to discuss their response to active shooter so that they can educate the community. And they've directly asked us to participate by sending, by allowing our teachers and staff and admin to go. And it's nice for me to report that uh, the first session was this week. It was the fourth. And so, or I guess that's last week now, the weeks kind of all roll, run together right now. But uh, on the 4th, last Thursday, um, and we had 53 staff members of GCS, High Point GCS schools attend the training last week. Um, the August 13th, unfortunately, I said there's two remaining. I found out about 30 minutes before this at about five o'clock, High Point um, has canceled that August 13th because that was a Saturday. And unfortunately, there just wasn't the interest for it. August 18th is at 6 p.m. at Green, uh, Green, Baptist, Green Street Baptist Church in High Point. And um, we ask, they ask that you reserve if you'd like to be there. Reserve the spot so they'll know what to expect, how many to expect, and they'll know if they'll continue. And uh, it's, a, it's a terrific program to go and, and see how High Point's going to respond and to have that in real terms and to hear it from the police officers. In addition to this, High Point Police Department also had leadership training that they conducted at the three high schools uh, in High Point where they discussed and showed every member of their command staff walked through, got a small tour of the school and continued um, around to, to really just see and to make themselves familiar with the schools. So that was terrific. And again, Guilford County Sheriff's Office is doing that with their staff and Greensboro Police Department has utilized their SRT team, what you might think of as SWAT team, to, to, um, for some training as well within our schools. So each day as our parents say goodbye to their children and send them off to school, we know that they're handing and entrusting their care off to us. And so that's why this is a top priority for us. You know, I, I showed you a slide earlier that I said I would always show you. There was one other thing I said that I would always tell you, and I, and I can't state this enough. Even with what we're doing and moving forward in security and the layers that we're trying to add and the layers we will continue to try to add as technology grows and as our capacity grows with it, is that the relationship between the students and a trusted adult and staff member are the most important relationships we can have and are the, make the most difference in school safety. Almost every threat we mitigated this year came because a child told an adult who contacted the right person to get the help. And that will continue to be here. And that will continue to be the most important part. And so I just can't stress that enough. We talk about it at every meeting we can. And my request of everyone who's, who might be watching this or who is here is that help that along. And help build that trust, be the one that helps create that trust so that we have those relationships so we can continue to keep our school safe. And that's the end of the presentation. So move to the questions and dialogue. Actually, I still like, I think y'all don't need that up there to, re to remember to ask questions or dialogue. So let's, let's go back. That's a much more pleasant, much more pleasant uh, slide. Thanks, Chief. I have a few um, questions. Kim, Betty, then Anita. Um, I really appreciate you coming back um, around this. In regard to school safety, um, I was asked a question um, yesterday. What can I do as a board member around safety for schools? So this is, this is going to be coming from a safety director, so I'm not sure it's the, the most politically astute or correct things to say. But um, the most important thing you can do is what we talked about at the very end which is help us build those relationships in the community. 
when you're in the community, which I know you attend a lot of events, help push that teachers, staff, our first cares for the children, and that we want to build those relationships. Help establish that and make sure that the community understands it and knows it in their heart. Because I'll, I'll tell you, in my year in the Guilford County Schools, that's the one thing that's come clear and through at every school I've attended is the care, devotion, and love of the staff towards the children. And that we're here and that we, we want to help in any way we can. The other question I have for you is, are there any federal funds available that you're aware of to help with securing the ongoing? The, the majority um, of the projects that we're uh, talking about today are actually with federal funds. Um, I, I think uh, Angie could discuss a little better about our grants and our grant process, but we're always looking at that. Okay, thank you. Certainly, so thank lots you. of what we're doing, um, the camera work, um, some of the other work that we we um, that uh, Mr. Ritchie mentioned is being funded with our ESSER federal ESSER dollars. Um, we also have opportunities. The Crisis Go was funded with the Department of Justice <coughs> grant it was. Um, that we uh, applied for directly to the Department of Justice, and uh, we continue to look for those opportunities as well. So, um, uh, and you know, we'll take advantage of anything that we can find. <laughs> Great, thank you. Betty, then Anita, Linda, then Diane. Okay, my concern is the safety plan for the subs. I know that the regular staff will be fully aware of the safety plan along with the administrator. But when you have a high um, absenteeism in your school, we need to make sure that the subs, whether it's the sub for the teacher sub for the front office staff or maybe the sub that's for the principal we need to make sure that all of them are on one accord and make sure they have something in writing some type of safety plan so they can follow to make sure that we um 100 in sync with the rest of the um school personnel yes ma'am thank you all mm -hmm. look into that make sure we have that thank you anita then linda okay um do you anticipate any supply chain issues? Yes, ma'am, we always do. Uh, with the screeners, uh, they're here, so I know that that supply chain is covered. So that makes me very happy. Um, the day I got the final call that they were here, that was a good thing. Um, right now, turnaround for cameras, depending on the type of camera that you have, is between 30 and 60 days. So that's better. It was eight to, eight to 10 weeks um, right now. So again, um, what, without getting too much into what we've just gone through over the last few days, the, the turnaround for the servers needed is also around four weeks. Okay. So it's, and um, the majority, everyone we discussed with had a number of things in stock to get started with and to help us change immediately. Okay, that's not unreasonable. Um, you talked about eventually that the students can report anonymously and I'm gonna ask for your opinion now. Okay, certainly. What is your opinion uh, that the students will trust the anonymity? So again, this is opinion and this is as much from being a dad, for, yeah. as, as much as being a dad as being a security expert. And that is that um, the kids overall actually don't seem near as worried about the anonymity as we as adults are. Um, they are active in every type of forum you can imagine on, uh, on their, their phones. They feel that their anonymity can be, a, can be achieved by changing a few initials and a few numbers and, and creating a, a different ID, and they do that regularly. Um, some of our larger issues have been kids who've tried to, to do just that. So I'm not as worried about that as I think the adults are, but I think that this gives an amount of safety so that the adults can help the kids say, hey, I trust it so so you can trust it. And again, that's as much from being a dad as it is from being a, any, anything with any kind of knowledge around security. And the final thing is, can you get to us in some way uh, the information on the Green Street meeting, time, yes. et cetera? And if they, who we contact? 
there is a link, asking for reservations. There is a link on the uh, on what went out and what we sent to the, to the staff, and we can send that same to you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Linda, Diane, then Deborah. Okay, a number that stood out very dramatic, dramatic for me mm -hmm. was 80% of attackers have been bullied. Yes. 80%. Yes, ma'am. I have gotten more reports of bullying this year than I have ever gotten. So my thing is, you know, we need to attack the source of the problem. All right, I'm not saying hundreds, but you know, I used to get one every blue moon. I have gotten several this year. Right. And consider, I mean, something that needs to be addressed. Yes. So my question is, what are we doing about addressing the bullying? And so um, I can't give you the specific program names because that's not something I run. But as part of the grant that we discussed, the Crisis Go grant, during that same time, half the grant was for the Crisis Go app and half the grant was for an anti-bullying program that they've been developing over the last year and a half, two years. They piloted it at at least three schools that I'm aware of and have fully implemented it at two, trying to move forward to, to push it throughout the district. Sorry that I don't know the name of the program. That's I, fine. I apologize for that. But that is where they're working in. Uh, in Mr. Robinson's shop, they have several staff members that are working with that um, daily and are really pushing that out to schools. It's an entire program that's been um, tested and has been found to be a best practice. Okay. So they are putting that in place. I will say that we have been much more open about bullying as well, and I think it is much more in the forefront and our awareness of it, our willingness to discuss it, and our willing to address it at the school level. Bullying was also part of the Leadership Institute this year. Um, so there was a, the Summer Leadership Institute just um, two weeks ago with all the principals and assistant principals, there was a session for each elementary, um, middle school and high school leadership around bullying and, and how to address bullying within the schools. Okay. So it is being looked at heavily. Well, I, I would be very interested in knowing what the program is and okay. seeing how it works and just for my own uh, interest. Um, the other one is, all right, we have high school kids. High school kids love to prank. Okay. So, you know, that there's a little concern that we might get using the crisis mm -hmm. go we may get some pranks. So I don't know if it's going to be an issue, but you know, something we need to keep in the forefront of our minds and how we would address that and how we would distinguish that. Right. And, and so that is one of many reasons why it goes straight to the admin leadership of the school. The, the men and women that have the experience of dealing with the high school kids as, as you, they, they understand them in ways that, that uh, many of us probably don't. But that's why it goes straight to them and those anonymous tips don't go out first mm -hmm. far and wide that okay. was one of the reasons for this because they can understand now obviously anything whether it's a prank or not by law we have to report but this gives them the opportunity to at least delve into it immediately and start immediately to determine if it is that prank. Okay. I mean, it was just, but it's you're just right. a thought that, process. That is always, there. yeah, that's, that's certainly something to be worried about. Okay, and then my um, last one is I know we have Gibsonville uh, Police Department, and they have reached out to me with, you know, wanting to, um, you know, be better prepared. Even though they only have one elementary school, it's been very um, prevalent to them that, you know, they have an, a way to, so if we're doing all this work with the Greensboro and the High Point, and I believe that any small towns that are out there that have an interest in being prepared if something like this nature happens, that we can, uh, they should be invited, in my opinion. I've already begun a dialogue with the Gibsonville town attorney, and we're discussing those issues and the parameters. Thank you. Thank you, Diane, then Deborah, then Pat. <clears throat> well, when you first came, if I remember, you uh, assured us that you had done a walkthrough 
of almost every school. And so I wonder that in light of Vivaldi, if you felt a need to go back and have your security staff do a walkthrough again, perhaps looking at things from uh, a different lens. Yes, ma'am, we have. So um, Mr. Trent and I so far this summer have completed seven walkthroughs of elementary schools. I have four more scheduled for this week alone. I know that Mr. Trent has at least another three for the rest of this week. And then we have them again all next week. And next week, we'll also be spending the, almost the entire week out of the office uh, at our high schools and then the schools that surround the high schools while we're installing the screeners. We're going out as part of that testing and part of that installation. And then while we're there, we will hit the other uh, company schools on the campus. And we'll continue till we're done with every elementary school in the district. My next question has to do with, uh, I think it was uh, slide uh, page one, uh, 13, um, where from what I have observed on uh, national TV, when it comes to parent unification, uh, it, it, does, it, it, it doesn't work well or it hasn't. I mean, it was quite ugly uh, in v Vivaldi. Um, how, do we, how do we help parents understand? So I don't know that we can override those emotions to where we, it doesn't look ugly in, in the end. Um, because there's not, there's not enough law enforcement, there's not enough security staff, there's not enough teachers to stop a parent who wants to get to their child. And I don't wanna be the one that's standing in that way either. But what we have to do is we have to, to have the, the plan in place. And again, I don't wanna to get too far into that plan. I'll be glad to discuss it with you outside of here. But that plan in place that, that where everyone is separated properly, but it is handled in a way that can be respectful and get everyone together as quickly as possible. Um, the reality is we have in, um, at any one time, we have roughly 400 law enforcement officers on duty in Guilford County, roughly. Sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less that are actually on duty. We have each of the teachers, we have our staff, and we're talking about having to, if it's at a high school, having to reunify 1,500, 2,000 children with not just their two parents, who may or may not be together, but their grandparents, their cousins. Um, in the Winston-Salem one, and we're trying to learn lessons from others, so we, we discuss this as a profession. And in Winston-Salem, they said that they had somewhere around 6,000 people show up for the children at Mount Tabor. And, and that is going to be a reality if any event like this happens. So what we're working on is finding the locations where that can be done the most efficiently and can be done in a way that will, will meet the needs of, of all. And, I, and I, again, I don't wanna get into those specific locations because that's not something we wanna have because then that yeah. would, <laughs> we, wouldn't, well, yeah. we wouldn't have that ability. Okay, but I but, guess but yes, we are looking at that <laughs> because there, there, there is, I, having been on this, the scenes of a lot of tragedies in my, in my career, there is not a, a great way to handle it other than being organized and going about it in the best way you can and with the best practices. Okay. And so, but it is something we look at regularly and are trying to find the best ways to do. Okay, I, I just feel like that we help parents with whatever our procedures are, if we figure out a way to, for those who appreciate you, trying to give them a heads up before you actually have the uh, incident happen, you know. Okay. And so I, and, and that's without, you know, breaching your security, but at the same time, right. just some steps, you know, of, I mean, we already have in place like the, um, what do you call it? Uh, the calling whenever you need to call uh, parents, uh, the right. phone connect, tree. Connect and, ads. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But just, you know, making sure that, you know, because like I said, I haven't seen any of these uh, unifications go well from all the way back from Columbine. They, and I understand why, because I understand if my baby was in that school, you know, I'm gonna be a mama bear and you're gonna probably mm -hmm. have to arrest me to keep me from finding my child. But right. we also wanna think about how do we best facilitate that mama bear so that she, does, she or he doesn't cause 
more of a problem in what you're trying to do. So, you know, helping to, you know, just explain the process. Out because, because sometimes, particularly with the high schools, you may also be looking for the perpetrator. Like down in Parkland, you know, he, he walked down the street. Uh, so, he, you know, you didn't, he was a part of. So sometimes you got to stop people just so you can find who you're looking for. And I understand that, but the parents understand that. And, you know, as opposed to thinking that you're just trying to keep them from their child. Um, you hadn't really spoken to this, and maybe you don't want to, about bus security. Um, and I know that's a probably a hard one because when you're driving through neighborhoods and picking up children, right. but do we train our bus drivers? Do they have a way to communicate if they have a problem? Or can you talk about that? They do have a way to communicate if they have a problem. And we have also one of the security measures that was put into place this year that since and, and quite frankly, I just didn't think of it when I'm putting together a slide because I wasn't the one that handled it. Um, our transportation department did a terrific job and have uh, actually are, have installed or are currently installing prior to the beginning of the school year cameras in every single bus. And they are new technology, so they are much more robust than the previous cameras in the buses. And if you remember, a number of our buses didn't actually have cameras. So these will actually be Wi-Fi enabled, which will allow information to get over more quickly, which will allow law enforcement to take action faster. Okay. And then my last question has to do with extracurricular activities. I'm sure you're highly aware of what happened last week at A&T's track and field. Yes. Uh, and though that's not exactly the same, it did involve children and parents. And, you know, from what we saw on television, it, that didn't go well either. Yes, ma'am. So... Um, do we have something specifically in place, or can you talk about that as far so, as what so, we're doing for our extracurriculum activities? So, so yes, there are, there are certain sports that do require, um, and, and these are sports that historically have had the largest turnout, the largest issues at them, that are required for high schools to provide um, law enforcement officers at. They're paid in the off-duty capacity in the same way that, that um, you would in all across Guilford County. And so that is at a, a number of our sporting events. Um, so that is that is one thing that is required. There is a safety plan. The next piece is, is um, these screeners can be moved. They are, I wouldn't call them portable, but I would call them movable. And they can be moved to stadiums so that they can be utilized in the stadiums on, and gymnasiums for that matter. Uh, on nights with um, games and especially rivalries, that type of thing. They can be utilized there. And that'll be up to the individual high schools as to what that policy is. Okay. Can, can, do we spend any time perhaps just talking to, um, well, we got a new uh, athletic director, so maybe this is something in, in her purview of just talking about behavior and security and, um, you know, because uh, this summer we've had, I, I saw at least three incidents where there somebody was shooting guns in the area of baseball fields. So, you know, just having people understand how to keep themselves safe or how to keep someone else safe if an incident were to, to happen. Because, they, you know, unfortunately right now there are no boundaries as far as people, uh, you know, perpetrating some form of violence uh, in group settings or in crowd settings. Yes. I, I've, I agree with everything you just, you, you said everything right. So there's no need Good. for me to, to comment on that. You were absolutely right on what we need to do there. All right. So I've, had, I've made a note on it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah, and then Pat. Um, first up, let me say thank you for the information that you provided in the past um, about effective uh, hardening, effective tactics, uh, and what is not effective, because I've been able to take that back when people ask questions and be like, here is actual, not collected by Guilford County Schools, third party, unbiased information saying that this is what can work, this is what definitely does not. So thank you, thank you, thank you for handing us that to stand on. Um, 
Is there um, a way that you could possibly let us know when uh, the scanners are put in uh, the uh, remaining schools so that we could maybe be there, be present when they're put in the schools in our district, or is that not something that you would like us to I, do? I could certainly get you the list of when they're, when they're going in. That that's, okay. I mean, they'll be in, all of them will be in uh, by the end of the 18th, and they'll all be there for the open houses on the 22nd. Mm -hmm. So you could certainly see them at that point as well. Um, I just I've had you know questions posed to me by the staff at the individual schools and I just wondered if being at the training would help okay me understand not necessarily the function of the scanners but more the process behind okay. um, how we're like one, dedicating one entry things like that um, I think I think the rest of mine got answered actually thank you thank you Pat yeah, thank you, Mr. Ritchie, and to your team for um, a, a, another really quality update. Um, I, I was more curious about the, the, I guess, the algorithm or the, the anonymity piece um, mm -hmm. in the Crisis Go. Yes. Uh, I mean, I'm sort of familiar with Gaggle. I know that's a different platform, but, um, and you said the, the, app, the app upgrade is coming this fall. Um, his, is, is, are there any successful sort of empirical models out there that Crisis Go that, you know, you could talk about that might be helpful for parents and, and, the, and the public that where they've been able to maybe any metrics or data that's out there? So we did not use an app for this, but we had a number of anonymous reports last year that led to successful outcomes for us um, stopping what was a threat or at least addressing the threat, because many of them were hoaxes, to, to Ms. Wellborn's point. Many of them were what they thought were pranks, which, again, aren't pranks. They're actually um, felonies in the state of North Carolina. And so um, it's, it's, that's a different outlook at it. And so we do have empirical data that an anonymous reporting does work. Now, having said that, in all but two, where we got it anonymously first, we then got it with names behind it almost directly afterwards. So, and then several where we had people who came forward, I want to tell you about this, we got them anonymous. So um, last year I'd say all in all, our threats that came through anonymous reporting one way or the other, whether first or, or last, so to speak, we probably had about 15 that came anonymous, which is not a large number um, in our district because there were a lot of threats and hoax, and, as there always have been with with children. And I'll just add, um, that's a app wide update, not when we're choosing to update right. it. And so we won't have that empirical data from the crisis go app until right. it launches for all users. I don't know if that's helpful. Right. Right. I just didn't know that if the technology has been at other, in other districts, for, for example, not, not that I'm aware of. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure it has somewhere. I'm, I'm just not personally sure aware of it. Yeah. Okay. That'd be interesting to, to, to know. Um, the other question, and I sort of, this wasn't a question I had uh, as you went through the presentation, but um, just just curious about, you, I think you touched on Forsyth County, how much sort of regional or across uh, inter-county uh, work is being done uh, with uh, folks like yourself? I mean, obviously, um, you know, shared expertise and shared accountability can be helpful. What, can you talk a little bit about that? Certainly. So um, the emergency managers across Guilford County and Forsyth County meet quarterly. Uh, we try to meet at least for an hour, hour and a half and discuss the issues that we're facing. And then when that meeting is over, typically the Forsyth County schools group and my group get together and we spend about another 30 minutes to talk and discuss and just make sure we're all up to date on what's going on. Um, and then there, uh, we collaborate a lot together informally a lot of phone calls between each other about different policies that are happening and going on. And then what we, we end up sharing a lot of information along that ends. But there is a formal meeting between all the emergency managers. That includes Guilford County Emergency Management, Forsyth County, UNCG, ANT, Winston-Salem State University, Wake Forest. Um, and so it's, it's a number. It also includes Moses Cone and Novant Health. So all of us have a different perspective of it, but we all have the same goal. And so we do meet quarterly. And that's been a very beneficial meeting. Yeah. How, how much, um, in your opinion, um, in experience, how, how much of a role do the SROs play? And would you say in our, in, in the corner, sort of the holistic approach, 
um, all hands on deck in terms of the safety um, and being uh, sort of on the front lines, if well, you will. So, you know, our SROs, one of the things that stressed among us and in our MOU is, again, I'm going to put it in my terms, not necessarily the MOU terms, which is that role as a trusted adult. One more person that can be reached out to and can be seen in emergency and can be talked to. And that is that is a role that our SROs really do serve, and it's something that our the agencies that provide the SROs stress, that it's the right personalities to go into the schools to help make relationships, whether with the adults or with the children. And so as a result, they make with both. So that's that's the first part. Second part, these are trained and well-trained law enforcement officers. All three agencies have very robust training. They all pay attention to the national um, conversations as they are at the time, whether they're the conversations around George Floyd in 2020 and paying attention to what that means to our community and how we properly deal with our community and how we grow in the face of, I'll say, self-imposed tragedy, all the way to current school shootings and this. These three agencies all learn from this and all are, are very good at making sure that their staff understand their role and understand the way to treat all. Diversity and inclusion is, is hugely important to them and that's hugely important to getting the right message into our schools. They're also a very visible presence in our schools that represent security and safety. And that, again, is the deterrent factor that we're hoping for. It's a deterrent factor that we're counting on with scanners and with cameras and with all the other pieces we're putting in. So it's one more, going back to what I said earlier, it's one more layer to keep our, our high schools and middle schools safe. Yeah, thank you. All right, I think that, oh, Diane? And I, I, I just overlooked this particular question. I think at the last meeting I did ask about uh, security for our um, facilities that are not um, uh, where schools are. And I hope that you were able to figure out what we can do to keep all of our staff yes. safe. So, so to that, we've got a um, plan in place right now, finishing up the access control project where the remainder of those funds are going towards the intercom systems and the, the access control systems that we have present in our schools. Uh, in fact, the plans for each of these buildings and their visible intercom system that will allow them to be able to see anyone that comes in before they come in to allow them to decide whether or not to let them in. Um, the same system we have out here will be in place at each of our out, out, outer campuses. So transportation, facilities, the other areas within this location and um, Franklin Boulevard and a few others, hopefully within the next couple of months. So there is on that, to, to your point on the uh, intercoms, there is about an eight week delay in supply chain on that. But those are going into place now and that's, that's our next piece there. Well, have you had like a security meeting for those buildings just to help those staffs understand what they need to do uh, in terms of whether it's barricading themselves in a part of the building or whatever. We have not had a specific meeting with them, no. Okay, would that fall with HR or somebody? Because no, I that, think would, that would fall with us. Okay. We can make that I, happen. I think helping staff understand how to protect themselves uh, in case there is a, uh, a breach or a threat would also be helpful in our investment in our staff to know that we're trying to do whatever we can to keep them safe and out of harm's way too. Yes, and we also have building managers, most of whom have been principals um, assigned to each of those buildings. So that will help with the training process so that we'll a we're able to filter that down. Another question you asked that I just wanted to make sure we answered um, was related to substitutes and part of substitute orientation is safety training. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Sorry, Ms. Jenkins. Um, as well as student teachers have to go through um, safety training as part of their orientation. So, um, you know, just one time is not enough, but it is part of that initial orientation for both groups. Just wanted to make sure you had that information. Thank you. All right. Um, well, I know this is a very complex situation, and 
Um, sometimes our questions and our recommendations um, make it sound as though it's simple or it's, you know, that there's a single or, you know, a few factors that are involved in this. And I'm just wondering um, how much time and resources are going into just really studying the, um, you know, just sort of what's behind all this. Because, you know, as, as, as board member Welburn was saying that, you know, all of the things that school shooters have in common, they're the same things that people who homicides and drive by shootings, it's the same thing, whether it's um, single parenting, divorce, um, uh, ab abuse, financial distress, whatever it is. But there's there's something because there's some peculiar characteristics to school shootings versus, um, I know I live in a um, high crime census tract. And um, I, th I think we lost a student and someone in, in that census tract yesterday. <laughs> and so so there's, there's a distance, but then there's a fine line too, that there's some relatedness with all of that. And I'm just, um, and it's, it's probably, that's even a complicated situation. I just don't want people to think that, you know, well, if we just did this or if we just did that, um, you know, that this is going to cut down on those things because, as we've seen, this is happening in the Midwest. It happens, um, you know, in high-income areas. It, 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 it's just not something that we can put our finger on so easily. Yes, ma'am. But thank you. All right, so we are now at um, our action items. And first is a contractual agreement with uh, True IP Solutions for district-wide safety and communications. Move the item. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All right, if you use your devices and vote, Dr. Funderburg, let us know when you're ready. All right. All right, passes by a vote of eight to one. It was eight to zero? Oh, it's one not voted. Okay, eight to zero, one's not voted. Thank you, and we are now at the 2022-2023 budget resolution. Good evening. So, Ms. Trexler, our interim chief financial officer, will bring us an update. The board has seen um, these updates for the past couple of meetings um, since the state passed a budget on time. <laughs> Thanks, Shirley. I had to put my glasses on because I said I thought that was Tara, but maybe Thank you. <laughs> Takes a village. Um, it is my pleasure to join you on this multi-month journey that you have been on um, to get to a budget resolution. The good news with that investment of time is the presentation you have. The majority of it, uh, Ms. Henry shared with you in July as the state did pass a budget, uh, essentially on time for the first time in several years. And we have four new slides that are in your material. We can certainly revisit any of the information that you would like to that has been previously shared. But in the essence of time, if you would like to start with slide 14, it's where our new information starts. So I will advance. Okay, and in your previous discussions, uh, of course, when the state legislature uh, mandates salaries and benefit costs and things of that nature, uh, it also applies, we apply that to our locally and federally funded employees. So since state was covered last month, we'll start with our local current I expense impact. And the first section is that uh, covers sustaining operations and the legislative impact. Uh, if you will remember, um, we talked about last month the growth in the charter school enrollment as well as they received their pro rata share of the county appropriation increase. And we'll talk a little bit about that in more detail. Um, but that is the, the first $2.5 listed here. Uh, the next two items 
to remind you from last month, uh, we are seeing additional increases in the retirement rate and the hospitalization insurance rate. So for our locally funded employees, you can see that impact is uh, in, a, in excess of 1.3 million and 440,000. I did think it was interesting this year, some of our employees, some of our classified employees, the benefits are now represent 60% of the amount we pay for salary. So we must match uh, benefits at 60% of what their salary is. For our beginning teachers, that, that rate is 49%. When we include both the retirement rate, the FICA match, and the uh, insurance premium that the employer pay, pays for each full-time employee. Uh, legislated salary increases for our teachers, assistant principals, our local non-certified and central office we reviewed last time. Uh, however, feel free to ask additional questions if anything is still unclear with those. And then utilities and a liability insurance increase round out our sustaining operations and legislative impact for nine million forty-seven thousand five hundred and twenty-two dollars. The next section uh, with our local current expense impact includes salary increase and other compensation initiatives that the board took to the county commissioners. Um, you see the amounts there. The teacher supplement increase of ten million was funded, the principal differential increase of two million and the assistant principal differential increase of 1.2 million. So that was an additional 13 million 200,000 to uh, increase our local budget. Uh, the negative figure there is not a bad thing. That is the increase. It's just our math equation on the, the right column. So it's negative, uh, but that is the increase in the accounting appropriation that we received this year of 19 million 200,000. And that left 3,047,522 for uh, our district to look in our local budget and redirect any funds that we could find on programs. Uh, we operate a little differently now. We do have the luxury of some additional ESSER funding. We have some programs that are eligible for state funding. So 1.5 million was identified previously in the budget process, and we have been able to identify uh, at this time without having to use the word cuts in the sense that um, there will be a real impact felt. So we're very fortunate uh, this fiscal year to be in that type of situation. So that brings us to a balanced local budget with the increases and the redirection and the county appropriation. If you would like to advance to slide 16, We'll see how all this fits together. And so for our 22-23 operating budget, we are very close to $1 billion. We have already received an additional allocation for our Read to Achieve summer program that doesn't come in on our state initial allotments. So as soon as we approve this and we're recording our first budget amendments, we will uh, exceed the $1 billion for our um, state funds. But as I mentioned, the state figure, 400, 473635202 is from our state initial allotments that were issued on or about July 26th, um, somewhere in that ballpark. Um, we also have our local county funding. It is almost $245 million in our county appropriation now. And then there are fines and forfeitures and a little bit of interest that we have uh, budgeted and expect to come in. Our federal funds, federal funds are on a different fiscal year. They operate on the federal fiscal year beginning October 1st. So this is based on estimates of planning allotments that we're given to work with at this time of year, as well as any anticipated carryover because those two fiscal years are different. Um, so th this will be amended as we go and we receive approvals on our planning budgets, but this is our starting point for our federal budgets. So you can see our um, pie chart here. The state money now represents 47.4%. Local is at 25.2%. Federal remains larger than in the pre-pandemic years. Um, with lots of ESSER money 
still flowing in our budget at 27.4%. So that's where our money and our operating budget comes from. Slide 17 gives us a picture of where our operating budget money goes. And salary and benefits are, of course, always our largest category due to the nature of um, our, how we operate. Uh, however, this is, tr is probably um, less than what you're used to seeing traditionally in school systems that it maybe is around 80, 85% um, percent salary and benefit cost. But because we do have a lot of the special federal money in here, some of that is um, heavier in the purchase service areas and supplies and materials than we would see in pre-pandemic years. Um, so salary and benefits exceed 723 million at 72.4%. Purchase services is 115.7 uh, million, and that is nearing 12% of our operating budget. Next is supplies and materials, 98 million, or 9.8%. Equipment uh, makes 33% of our operating budget, and that's 3.3%. And then our transfer to charter schools, as we've discussed, is 29 million or 2.9% of our operating budget. As I advance to page 18, what we just discussed is the first three lines, the state, local, and federal, um, that is our operating budget, but we also, to pull in for the overall picture, have added the capital outlay fund and it shows the amount of our 21-22 budget resolution compared to our 22-23 um, capital outlay. You're familiar with the 10 million figure. There's 2 million in public school building capital fund um, money, as well as 8 million in the county appropriation. If you'll recall in June, you approved activity bus fee transfer. That's the 34 million. That was the um, fees collected. Uh, last year that will go towards purchasing activity buses. Um, so this year's amount to add to that is the $34,751. Um, school nutrition, uh, you've heard earlier tonight and previously that the school nutrition waivers have ended. So there is a slight decrease there uh, as we look forward to operating um, under pre-pandemic conditions instead of the um, free lunch for all students. Um, ACES fund, and last year we were able to restart ACES. Um, the amount we are projecting in the initial budget this year is closer in line to the actual activity that occurred last year. We had to make an estimate last year not based on um, previous scaled back numbers. Uh, so now we have last year's data to look at, and that will um, put us in the neighborhood of $4.8 million for our ACES fund. And then our special revenue fund, this varies from year to year, uh, depending on how our NC Pre-K, uh, ROTC funding, Medicaid funding, and indirect costs, what those projections are. So you'll see lots of amendments that come through uh, our special revenue fund as well during the year but this does include those primary um, budget estimates that we expect. So, Thanks, Tara. That's what we prepared. Anita? Um, okay. Talk to me a little bit about the state increases for classified employees. I thought I heard it was Everyone will be at 15, and then there was 4% raise? Or 4%, yes. So you, tell, oh, translate that into a person for me. Okay, if I already make above um, $15 an hour, say I'm an employee that makes $40,000 a year, then I would receive 4% in addition to the 40,000 I received last year. Okay, um, let's say you're raised up to the 15 this year. What's that scenario? 
uh, if it's is the higher of the 15 or the 4 percent. Did so, the state say that? Yes, and that should be on one of our uh, slides earlier. So it's either 15 or 4 percent. So if I'm at 1489, they can figure 1490. You would get 4 percent, I'm sorry. Okay. So this, yeah, the, you know, the state raised it to $13 last year. Mm -hmm. And if you only give them, if you only give the staff who are at $13 an hour 4%, it brings them to 1352 Right. So they're getting the, up to $15 an hour because it's greater than the 4%. But if you're at 1489 yeah. as you just mentioned, then you get 4% because that's going to take you above the $15 an hour. Anita? Um, yeah, I'm thinking about it, but yeah, for now. Cam, Diane, then Deborah. Yeah, I have a um, concern in regard to the ESSA funds that we've set aside, like for programs like uh, people getting education. And because I know there's a deadline on those funds. So, what are we thinking about if those funds aren't used and we're coming to the deadline? of having to use those funds i do i hope that we're thinking about redirecting them and not allowing them to sit there if people aren't using them for the things that we've allocated it for we will not be not using them um, <laughs> <laughs> i mean some examples are the wave of devices um, and we've been just talking lately about just the cost of lost chargers things like that. Um, but there are contingency plans in place. We touch it every month. Uh, we just had a meeting this week to go through what's being spent, what's not, what's the plan to redirect, staying in our strategies and our plan. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Diane, then Deborah. Okay. Okay. And this is, this might not be a question that you can answer. I think, uh, Ms. Henry, Henry, probably has more imagination in this realm. What happens when there are no ESSER funds and you got programs that we've put in place? Will, will we be in a position to, to get that taken care of by the county? I don't think we'll be able to get all of the things. To, I mean, they're, they're not going to be able to come up with the 300 million that we received and Ms. Henry can certainly weigh in, but we were very intentional. Um, about our plan and making sure that we did not go buy a lot of people or did that we did not create um, our you know this this cliff that we're going to fall off of so um, for example we invested in um, library books we invested in professional learning we um, we tried to do things so that we, as we phase them out over the course of the spring and summer of 2024 that we won't be left in this place where our organization doesn't know how to exist or can't continue to make progress. So um, I think the intention that went into the plan itself was so that we don't end up in, in another, another place. There are districts who hired additional staff to be in schools. Um, and I think that they are, I, I do think that there are some places that are going to feel it across the nation. We have um, monthly meetings with our peer groups where they're talking about now what are they going to do about it. I am hopeful that some of the programs that have seen some success like tutoring um, and learning hubs that we're able to think creatively, look at grants and talk about um, what we can do to sustain things that we know are making differences for kids because we won't be recovered from the pandemic when the funds end in September of, of 2024. That's just the reality. Okay, um, did we ever get all of the camera um, money that the city owed us? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we got all of yeah, that. We spent that. Um, yes. <laughs> on page 17, um, I hope that you will uh, give us a, a breakdown of what MWBE looks like uh, in the purchases of services, supply of material, equipment. Um, you know, this is something that we have to continue to monitor, look at, see how we can improve it, 
and make sure that whatever NWP participation we have is not at just one particular level, that it's using professional services, that it's, you know, that it's not just janitorial, that, you know, we, we, we are intentional because that's a lot of money, but do we see it? And I haven't seen a report in a while, and I know you've been busy doing other things, but, <clears throat> you know, and even the ESSER funds, I mean, do we have any way of knowing, you know, if that has had an impact on uh, MWBE uh, participation? And as the gentleman said, you know, locally, are, are we able to, I know we can't get everything locally because we can't, but those things that we can, and it still meets our standards because I don't want us to do any of these things if they don't meet our standards of what we need to get the quality of supplies, work, whatever, uh, for what we need. Sure. So um, we continue to measure our hub participation and, and submit those reports to the state. And I will look back to see the last ones that I sent you. I'm, I, may, I know I owe, we owe fourth quarter because that hasn't been finalized yet for um, 21, 22, but we'll get you the, the most up to date. Um, we are, we, we do work very hard to, to try to be intentional in as many um, opportunities as we have. As you know, we have less flexibility with our non-construction dollars as far as MWBE participation than we do with our construction dollars. Um, but we um, did some work this spring um, and we'll bring it back up in our next principals meeting to um, you know, make principals aware of all the MWBE vendors that we have registered in our system by their commodity code um, so that they can, um, in, in instances where everything doesn't, ha I mean, there are thresholds that where we have to bid certain things, but there are opportunities where, where purchases may be under those thresholds that we can, we can um, identify, you know, and, and target specifically using MWBE vendors in those cases. And that's what we're trying to share with, with principals um, and take, take advantage mm -hmm. of those opportunities when we can. Okay, on uh, ACES, is there a way for us to uh, break out <clears throat> the ACES budget as far as, uh, it's an enterprise fund. So I think it would be helpful to our uh, uh, ACES directors to know what they might can help to do to generate the funds uh, in terms of getting, you know, if, if, you know, if they haven't met their allotment of how many children that they can have. Um, and I think that would be helpful to the ACES directors to know that if they have a program that has only 20 children enrolled, but they have the capacity for 40. And, you know, you would say, think that they know that, but I think it would be helpful to break their budget out and show exactly, you know, this is what you've done, this is what you need to do in order to continue to be an enterprise fund. Because I don't want us to be discussing getting rid of ACEs at any other point in time because they aren't making the money. And, you know, since that, that is a fund that has to be self-supporting, I think it's, it would be helpful for them to know exactly what, uh, what they need uh, to shoot for. We have, um, and we'll continue. So we met with individual principals so they would understand. So they're licensed for a certain number of students and, um, you know, we, and it depends on their license space. So it absolutely has impacts for the revenue mm -hmm. um, in the enterprise fund. So um, that information was shared um, in the last three weeks with principals of each site and then will be shared as um, the site coordinators return. Um, just what their goal is. We have reached out individually for it to the a few sites that are down in enrollment, sharing, please use open house, here's where you need to get to, and here's what it means for the fund. Okay, but what, I guess our, the assumption is that they know where those monies go, but I think it would be helpful to the site coordinators to know that, okay, you know, just what you've done for us, here's your, here's your revenue, Here's what the expenditures go for. Mm -hmm. So that if if they're going for uh, food, if they're going for supplies, mm -hmm. just to you know help everybody understand that we're that here's what you got to work with. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, knowledge is power if we use it right. 
And then um, the last one is just kind of a, uh, an anticipation. And I don't know if we qualify or not, but if the Congress uh, does what it's supposed to do and passes this uh, bill that uh, is supposed to go to the president, there's a big chunk of money in there for renewable energy and solar. Do schools or entities like us, um, are we eligible for rebates or those kinds of things if they became available in, in thinking about us, if we're building, um, you know, rebuilding energy schools, if we decide <laughs> that we want to include solar in, in that building process, um, would we be eligible for that? And I know you can't necessarily answer because we got to wait and see what the Congress does and they're fickle, but what I am saying is, can we be on the lookout for that and find out would we, would our entity be eligible for, um, for rebates as, as uh, private homeowners or whomever, uh, even in using electric buses, because I do think that there's a rebate that's supposed to come down the pipe for people who buy electric cars. So, you know, and maybe nobody's asked the question, so maybe we need to ask the question of our representatives is that, is this something that can happen for schools that invest in renewable energy uh, tools, whether it's buses, whether it's uh, putting solar uh, on some of our schools? We can certainly look look for those opportunities. Sometimes those come across as tax credits, mm -hmm. and as an entity that doesn't pay tax, um, we may not be eligible for everything that an uh, individual would be eligible for. We don't pay personal income tax as, a, as an organization, but definitely thank you for that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you and welcome. Yeah. Don't worry. We're not going to eat you. I, I do want to follow up, though, and say um, in years prior, um, we have been able to take, take advantage of, like, um, Duke Energy rebates for LED switching out LED lights and things like that. So there, I mean, we, we take advantage of the opportunities when they are available to us, but as Ms. Trackler mentioned, many times those are in the form of tax credits and, and so, you know, it makes it difficult in those cases, but we certainly keep our eyes out. Do we know yeah. at this time, do we plan to have any solar uh, installation in any of our schools? You mean solar panels? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. We do? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Yeah, if we could look back at page 14, please. Um, with a salary increase and other compensation initiatives, do we have n like numbers, how many teachers will be, will be uh, receiving the supplement increase principals and APs? Do we have any solid numbers, how many of those were given out? Um, yeah, so every, all of our teachers that are all of our staff that are paid on the licensed teacher salary schedule, and that includes our teachers, our counselors, our media specialists, our social workers. I'm trying to think. I think that covers, I mean, there's a there's a fairly broad spectrum are, are receiving the increase in the teacher supplement. So that'll be um, over 5,000 teachers and it's $725. Of the new supplement minimum amount will be $725 a month. Um, one of, uh, also note that along with that goes the 32.15% increase uh, in benefits that has to go along with that. So for every extra hundred and you know, dollars that we're paying, we're having to pay $32 in uh, benefits. So um, if you're trying to do the math with the $10 million and trying to you know calculate that out, you've got to take that into consideration. But that's we feel like that's a significant increase. It'll move us if nothing else changes, no, no other district changes across the state, it would move us to seventh in the state um, when we compared ourselves with other districts where we were for 21-22. Um, it won't change our ranking among the, the five districts that we typically, or the four other districts we typically compare ourselves to, but it really puts us in a good position um, with our um, competitive salary for our teachers. For the principal increase and the assistant principal increase, that's touching every principal, I mean, it's every principal. There may be a, a three or four, I can't remember the number. There's a very small, very, I mean, less than a handful number who are grandfathered, but um, almost every principal has been um, received an, an increase in their salary um, with this increase in, with this additional increase in the restructuring of the principal salary schedule. And then the assistant principals, um, I believe every assistant principal is, is going to receive an increase based on the new salary schedule. 
Okay, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see, looking at the transfers to charter schools of the 2.9% of our budget, do we know if this is on par with the other large districts or are we, you know, giving less or more of our total percentage to charter schools? Where so I don't, I don't have facts to share. I, anecdotally, I would say we have as a percentage of our enrollment is less than when you look at like Charlotte and Wake of the number of students in charter schools. Um, Durham has a significant number of students in charter schools, so their percentage is probably higher, but then there are other districts, um, you know, that are much smaller than, than our percentage. It just depends on what county you're in, um, what the demand for charter schools is in, in those counties. Um, and sure. lots of times the per pupil amount in a county is so small, it, it just doesn't make sense to open a, a charter school to try to operate with such a small per pupil amount um, of county funding. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Um, and then, yeah, you guys know, I already put in my shameless plug with, uh, with Dr. Oakley, Dr. Oakley and with Angie that, you know, if we do have a, a good chunk of leftover Esther that we consider additional bonuses for our teachers and staff. I'm already, already aggravating them with it. So, <laughs> um, I think that's all I had. Thank you, Betty, and then Anita. Just wondering, since the ESSA funds will be depleted in 24, how many, I'll need to know what the staff, who the staff members are, how many staff members are being paid through ESSA funds? I believe it's a very, very small number. It's the tutoring, it's some tutoring staff. It's, it's all that Minority we have. Staff. Oh, okay. We may be paying some extended employment agreements for tutors or um, some interpreters, but it's, I mean, that's extra duties. It's not their base salary. So we, we really don't have um, a lot of people paid. Good, yeah. okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Anita. Um, let's talk about ACEs a little bit. One question is for Dr. Oakley and we cut back the number of our sites with ACES. How would a school go about getting their site back if they had enough students to make it financially? Viable? So you're right. Um, I think we have 29. I'll make sure that that number is correct of schools that are up and running. And when schools have reached out, particularly those that had ACES before COVID, um, we have asked them to do a parent survey to make sure that they have enough interest to warrant reopening. We've been able to do that with three additional schools to what we originally started with. Now some of them go way back down in the summer and so they're having to ramp back up and you know go door to door at, um, and use open house as a way. Um, so we have added programs when they've shown us that there's sufficient parent interest um, and we're open to continuing to do that. Um, but we still have some larger programs that are subsidizing smaller programs. So we have to make sure that the interest is there and principals have worked closely with us to make that happen. All right, and now the budgeting questions there. Um, there's an ACES director, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Overall, who has a budget is that correct? Yes. Okay, now the individual sites have directors or someone's in charge of the site. Site coordinator. I don't know what you call them, mm -hmm. yeah. Do they have a budget? I do not yet know how they <laughs> operate um, once it is to the department. When um, it gets to that level, yeah. I could get that information for you, but yeah, I think they have a, well, well, let us verify that. I, I think they have a, a small budget. I can't with imagine some would flexibility have a for some supplies and yeah. some snacks and some field trip things, but um, I don't, I mean, it's not like they have to manage the whole program budget. There are some things that we do centrally that we manage centrally. So they, they have some dollars that they have some flexibility with, but it's not for the total program. Well, I'm asking that because of other questions that have been asked tonight. And I, I would assume, um, and I hope I'm not wrong in that assumption, that they know what they have to spend. They do. And they can they have some flexibility mm -hmm. in how they spend it, right. but they can't just randomly go start spending money. 
that, that there, there, are, there are guardrails in place yeah. um, for all of the programs. Just like anybody. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Pat? Yeah, I just had one question on page eight. Um, I see the bonuses for a, um, APIB and CTE, and it mentions uh, teachers uh, third through eighth grade. The bonuses will be reinstated, but I just didn't see a, a dollar figure. I was just curious on what um, the performance bonuses on page eight. It says um, they'll be reinstated, but I just didn't know what the what they were getting. But these are guaranteed allotments, correct? They are guaranteed allotments, but the amount that they get, I think, depends on the number of teachers who earn the bonus across the state who meet a percentage of growth. Yeah, so yeah, so it's the top 25 percent. They they get a bonus, but they don't know what dollar amount that is. Do they know what the the denominator is to divide by? I see. So it's based on a pool, sort of. Yes. It's okay. complicated, and it only applies to teachers in tested subject areas. So they have to have growth data in, able, in order to be in the 25%, and it's a curve equivalent. So, like, mm -hmm. only X number of teachers in the state meet the growth criteria in tested subject areas that have growth data. So it's... Um, it's not something that we can put a hard number in until after EVOS data is released, verified, and then verified at the state level to come to us. I see. Okay. Yep. So that'll come as a budget amendment later. Right. Um, it, there's it, a state budget that uh, we receive the list of the, the teachers and the dollar amount to pay, and then once that occurs, we'll bring a budget amendment when we know that complete amount later in the year. Well, I hope we have a whole bunch. I mean, you know. yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Pat. I don't see any other questions. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Um, let's use our devices and vote. All right, that passes unanimously. And we are now at uh, closed session, and I believe we have one. Jill, will we need to come back in open session with any? Well, let's do that so that our um, audience can um, do the things they need to do. So I will start with you, Ms. Irby. Oh, thank you. Um, let's see. I had a chance to be a reader at Freedom School and that's when I learned about the the old Kirkman Park that, around the corner, you know, from the new Kirkman Park. It's very interesting how we do things in Guilford County and building new and keeping the old. Um, so, you know, it was good to see the children in Freedom School. I want to commend, you know, Mr. Moses um, for directing that program. Um, I was able to you know, give the teachers a gift um, in that program because they look like they were just working so hard for our kids. Um, and I got adopted. One of the students asked me if I could be her grandmother, um, if I could adopt her, you know, and she could become my grandchild. Um, I thought that was interesting. <laughs> so I guess that is a compliment. Um, but they were just so precious just to see the children um, you know, participating in that program and being able to engage them. Um, it's just, a, I hope that we can do get more of that funding for the Freedom School um, in the summertime and maybe figure out a way for it to continue, like, throughout the school year. I hope that, you know, principals, you know, um, Mr. Hagee had the program prior and I was engaged um, over at Fair, Fairview. And it's just a good program for our children. Um, and to see them, you know, over the summer, just excited about learning. Um, so I hope we can get some more money for that. Um, again, congratulations to the ANC for renaming um, Celebration. Um, that just was a time in history, and I'm glad that we are part of that. Um, and, you know, welcome back, and let's get it going. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Again, good evening. 
I'd uh, like to remind the parents to please, if you have a kindergarten student, please, please, please start enrolling them in your local um, district school. Um, looking forward to attend the open houses for my schools in District 7. Thoroughly enjoyed the Joint Facilities Committee meeting today. Um, hats off to our chair and also the chairman, um, Skip Austin. They did a remarkable job along with all the um, presenters. Thank all the principals who shared information for the District 7 August 2022 newsletter. And I enjoyed meeting um, new principal Dr. Brooks and Mr. Nixon, which who are at Bessemer and at Harrison. And that's all I have for now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deborah. Okay, um, first I would like to um, kind of go back to something that Mike Ritchie mentioned um, about principals doing walkthroughs with their staff of the schools to prepare just for anything that may come at them. I'd like to, you know, just stop and say thank you for taking that time, taking those minutes to connect with the staff, take that physical walkthrough and, and be that leadership and physical presence with them to lead the staff and say, this is what we do in an emergency. I am here. I understand how it works. So now you're here. You understand how it works. And so, you know, when, if, 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 if anything were to ever come, they have it in their head and they know that their administration and, and the people immediately above them know what they're doing. I can't imagine how valuable that has to be for the staff. Um, and in that vein, I would also like to say, you know, I think as we learn more and more about Rob Elementary in Uvalde, um, that police officers has really taken a hard hit. Um, I know Mike well. I know our current uh, uh, interim chief for GPD very well. I still know several of the officers, and I have to tell you guys, you know, I've got kids in different schools in Guilford County, and I, I, I don't worry about that from our officers. I don't worry about them running. I know these men. I know these women. I know they'll stand. It's wonderful to hear about the training. I'm glad they're being so thorough. They'll stand for our children. I know they will. Um, finally, uh, as I am very wont to do, uh, the last time we spoke about uh, enrollment centers, I did stick my foot in my mouth a bit. And um, thank you to the staff members who called me on it because I will say that when I was talking about the enrollment process at the different schools and how complicated it can be and how frustrating that um, that was not intended as a reflection on the staff at those schools. Those difficulties are not a result of the people who are doing these enrollment processes. It is a result of the process. Every district has a different process. Every district calls every paper by a different name. Um, and then the state has different requirements. Doctor's offices all do it differently. Everyone's process is different. And hopefully the goal of an enrollment center would be to streamline our processes. And um, those, there again, are not the result of the people trying to work through them. So I do apologize for that one because it was not intended to malign any of the staff at any of the schools. They're doing their dead level best with all these pieces of paper that they have to track down. Um, but the good news was the feedback that I've gotten is that the enrollment centers do seem to be wholeheartedly supported. And with our staff saying this would be a huge help to us here at the schools, I will continue to throw that throw my support behind us. Thank you, Anita. I would just like to say to my schools who have already started back, um, everything seemed very smooth and their early openings have went well. Um, I look forward to the beginning of school on August 29th. It's always an exciting, refreshing time. I want to thank all the staff here in the central office who has worked diligently this summer getting things ready. And to the site managers, the principals, the APs, all the planning, um, I expect a smooth opening, and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Diane? Um, today, the uh, Community Food Task Force <clears throat> had a meeting. It was sponsored by the Guilford County uh, Cooperative uh, Extension. And uh, um, I was able to um, tell them that we needed for families to apply and actually uh, give them the link in the chat. So whoever handles that, I did it. 
So that was another way of getting people um, who are very interested in what we're doing to get food to people um, in Guilford County and Forsyth County. And um, they were very appreciative that Guilford County Schools had been a partner with them. Um, the food bank primarily works with our back, uh, what do you call it, backpack program and trying to make sure that uh, children and families have food uh, during the time when they're not in school. But they did give us kudos for, kudos for being the, um, the lead during the pandemic to feed families um, and, and what we did uh, for that. Their next meeting is uh, November the 8th. So if you're interested, uh, you can uh, contact the Guilford County Co-op uh, Extension because there is some funding that the Guilford County uh, commissioners did approve to deal with uh, food insecurity in Guilford County. So we need to make sure that um, we talk for our kids and for our families in that process. The High Point Extraordinary Ed Educators Luncheon is going to be on um, sept uh, August the 19th. And if you're interested in going, you can register through the G GEA website. The Heads Up for your, our youth is having their seventh annual back to school event mm -hmm. on Sunday, August the 21st at the Coliseum Fieldhouse from three to six. And um, Dwayne Shaw has over the years tried to develop this thing to include as many um, uh, community partners as possible as far as getting information to parents. So it's not just come pick up a, a, um, a backpack and go home uh, last year we were able to do um, testing for COVID there. And uh, I'm hoping that some of those agencies will be there this year. So if you have an opportunity to uh, go there um, and they have a, a, a good basketball game, this year is gonna be uh, the police against the barbers. So my money is on the barbers. <laughs> um, we lost another community leader who had been very supportive of our schools and his church uh, played a significant part uh, when we had the tornadoes as far as uh, uh, being a, 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 um, a go-to place. And he was a pastor of Laughlin um, um, United Methodist, Dr. Reverend uh, George uh, Melvin Coates. Uh, died last week and uh, he was funeralized. But um, he was very significant mm -hmm. to our community. And it's just like, you know, we... <laughs> We remember Nora tonight, and I know we got to move on and keep doing what we got to do. But I hope that the Carr family and other families that we try to let them know that we do care, that we um, don't forget about um, those folks that made a significant um, contribution to what we're trying to do and what you know we will do. Um, uh, so for for the Coast family. We want to thank them for uh, what George did in our community. Um, his wife is a minister too, and she also is very, very active in our community. And then I want to thank all of our GCS staff for gearing up for the 2022-23 school year. Um, I was at the pool one day, and a guy said to me at the end of the school year, he said, well, y'all finished for the year. And I said, no, we ain't. I said, we finished that year, but we are already working on the next year. So I said, there is no real break time because we, we can't, you know, even though we sent those babies off in, in caps and gowns, we still had to start preparing for the next year. And I don't think people realize that this is a 24-7, 365 days a year, and whenever it is leap year, 366 day a year uh, commitment that all of us make. So um, we can't pay you, but we can thank you. So I just want to thank everybody for all of the hard work um, that you continue to do, and uh, whether you're on vacation or not. When I've talked to staff and they say, yeah, I'm on vacation, but my cell phone is available, and so you ain't on vacation then. But we appreciate your commitment, uh, and we appreciate what our folks in the field are doing, and I hope we have a safe and productive year, and I hope we catch up with our COVID loss so that these kids don't have to spend five years trying to catch up. I think we can do it. I think we have the, the staff and the know-how to bring our kids along um, in a short period of time as opposed to it taking for years to 
recover from what we lost with COVID. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Yeah, I'll keep my comments brief. Just uh, want to lift up all the teachers and principals, you know, as I've talked to uh, some of them over the course of the year and over the summer, you know, your job really is, you know, you don't have any time off. Um, it's staff members here, they're sitting before us. We, we know and we appreciate uh, that level of work and all the efforts that you put in every day through the summer, weekends. Uh, it's not lost on, on me personally, uh, the commitment that you um, share with, with, uh, with our children. And so, and as a you know, dad with, with still two students at two different levels of school, um, and all the kids, you know, it really means a lot. And so I always love this time of year as we enter into uh, the school year because it's a chance to, to start over. You know, it's not like you're stuck where you were last year. Every year's new. Every opportunity's new. Every uh, young child is, is looking at you, the teacher, the principal, those that they interact with, um, and for you to guide and coach and love and teach them. So I always feel like um, every year we get a chance to start over and, and be better uh, and learn and, and grow ourselves. So just uh, it's a great time. Uh, all the students and, and families, uh, we're here to support you in any way we can and uh, look forward to a great school year. I also wanted to applaud uh, our Guilford Education Alliance uh, and First Bank for their incredible support. I think we had almost 140 new teachers uh, this year that we're able to stock up on supplies at, at no at no cost to them. Um, so I really appreciate all those efforts around that. Uh, I did sit in for most the majority of the meeting uh, today that we had our first um, joint board of commissioners uh, and, and and school board uh, joint facility committee. The first one we've had in, in I think in a few years or a couple of years. And so that was refreshing. Um, and, and certainly alarming in some ways in terms of just the sheer cost uh, in this economy that we're in of materials. It, it was really uh, incredibly eye-opening to see the cost of steel and lumber and adhesives and all the things that you really, uh, it, nationwide, not, not just here. So I appreciate all the work, um, Madam Chair, that you put in and uh, the county commissioners and, and my fellow board members for that. We'll look forward to more conversations. and. Not to be lost in the fact that when I always think of this as so sacred, when voters go to vote for these bonds and for, for elected officials, anything on the ballot, um, that confidence and that support when they say, I'm approving this amount of money, and then for, through no fault of our own, we have, we're coming back and you know, we've got to make some really tough decisions. And so uh, I hope that we'll lean into that work and uh, have the support and the tough questions that need to come along with it. So uh, I always like to preface that, uh, that when voters go, that's a very sacred thing and they approve a certain amount of money. And it's it's difficult when we have to come back and, and make those tough decisions, but it's the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Um, number one, I wanna say that um, I didn't make it out to National Night Out in Gibsonville that is supported by the Gibsonville PD. And then this evening we talked about how much we were engaging with our Greensboro Police, our Sheriff Department, and our High Point Police Departments. We need them to work with us. And so I'm really happy to see that relationship building so that we can build positive relationships with our communities and that everybody can work together to make keep our children safe. And I think that's a great. The other thing I want to say, State, is I met Ms. Wall at Nathaniel Green. She invited me for an open house, and she had a great turnout. But I want you to know it was outside, and I melted, <laughs> even though I was handing out the frozen popsicles, okay? So uh, it was great. It was great to, great to see uh, how many families came out to meet Ms. Wall. I think, um, you know, the community is looking forward to moving and working with Ms. Wall. So that was great. It could have just been about 10 degrees. Uh, I'm telling you, I was melting. So anyway, it was great. And I'm looking for, you know, I, I want the children to finish enjoying their summer. The few that have not already returned to school 
And, um, you know, we, we've got our first year in back a full, full-time school. I think we're only going to improve. I appreciate all the teachers, staff, everybody working hard to, to bring us up back up to full speed as far as getting it rolling again. And I think our locomotive will continue to speed up as we get traction. So thank you. And I'm looking to, forward to a great 22-23. Um, Great, thank you. Um, I, I ate four different ice creams at National Night Out. I had a bomb pop and the strawberry crunch. And yeah, I had like fudge sickle. I ate four of them. I couldn't stop eating. I hadn't had them since I was a kid and they were free and they were in the little thing. So, so I had four of them. Um, but it was, uh, I really enjoyed National Night Out and the Night Out for Safety and Liberation are, were held that same night. Um, there are a couple of back to school um, events happening. Uh, one is August 15th by the Gate City Coalition from 4 to 7 at the Hickory Trails location. And it's a back to school event with um, back to school supplies, but it's also a water fight. So, um, yeah, so it's balloons and water squirts and all of that stuff. Uh, and then there's one, I think, August 20th at the Renaissance Plaza off of Phillips Avenue from 11 to 2. So, and I know there are a ton of them that are going on. So, Hmm. Carl Chavis, that's right. They they have one there, so we'll get those dates, and I'll just make sure that same day, same day August twentieth. What time? Uh, Eleven to two. What okay, around, around that same time. time. So, um, you know, back to school supplies, backpacks, information, vendors, um, all of those that are out. And um, I really did the, enjoy the joint facilities meeting today. I learned so much. Um, you just think you, you've you learned a lot, but learned so much more. And Dr. Oakley, you were saying something about the facilities and for our students who um, have hearing impairments. And it's not just the leaky roofs and the bad carpet and the um, inadequate HVACs, but it's also how they're designed, the acoustics and things like that make it difficult for students to hear and to learn. So, um, and Pat, like you, I was just, um, again, overwhelmed by the, um, not just the supply chain, but how the war in Ukraine and how that affects, you know, certain materials like furniture, fixtures, and equipment. So there's just so much that is going into this and also to hear from the industry experts that they usually expect like a 5% inflation around uh, the construction industry. And I think he said we're at 30%. Mm -hmm. yep. So it, it's, and, and again, our master facilities plan was done in 2019 prior to the pandemic. So, um, so anyway, it was just a, a great meeting. So thank you, Pat Winston and Betty and commissioner Alston, the county commissioners and the experts and the staff that was with us today. Uh, and the last thing, I'm sorry I won't be able to attend the retiree celebration tomorrow, but please offer my congratulations to people who are uh, entering that enjoyment. I do want to, I, I have to attend services. My cousin died unexpectedly last week, and um, her name is Teresa Ann Hayes Amuson, and she was one of the first African-American students to integrate High Point City Schools, went to Kirkman Park and Ragsdale. So just want to lift her up, so your prayers for the Hayes family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Um, so it will be appreciated. And with that said, we'll um, take a motion to go into closed session. I move we go into closed session to preserve the attorney-client privilege and to give advice and instruction to our attorney and staff regarding a contested case in captioned AP on behalf of NJL versus the Guilford County Board of Education. So is, uh, all those in favor say aye. All right. Any opposed? All right. We're in closed session. We will not have anything to report. We will just uh, probably, I don't know. Okay. Okay. So we will just come open back up and dismiss.